still here anyway. Um, probably known through his books, which we have in the school store, by the way, and uh, a record that he made a while ago. Hint, hint. Um, uh, let me see. He's probably influenced a lot of guitar players uh, that teach you here at this school. Um, I won't talk a lot. I'll let him play. Um, he's probably going to play a little bit and uh, do a bit of a clinic kind of thing. If you have questions, you can ask. Or if you want him to play more, just tell him. Um, talk first, then play. Um, I have a, a, just a personal suggestion for you. Uh, after you've seen the clinic, watch the video lots of times because you'll see lots of things you didn't notice the first time. It'll, be, it'll surprise you. Um, oh, just to give you an idea of, of uh, Ted's wide appeal, uh, I interviewed Steve Vai about a month ago, and he went wild when he heard uh, Ted Green was going to come here. He couldn't make it tonight because he's out of town or something, but excited about it. Better things to do. I don't know. Okay, give uh, Ted Green a warm welcome, please. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Let's get used to this microphone. Oh, you got to talk kind of loudly. You got to push your voice into this. Whoa. Uh, I, I, uh, I guess I'm a little surprised. I thought that a lot of people would have guitars, like out, you know, like we were going to do a workshop or something. I guess this is going to be a little different. But uh, we'll talk, still talk a lot about guitar and. Uh, do some playing, take a couple of breaks so it's not too uh, interminable, terminable, whatever the word is. Uh, Kirk, will this mic pick up if I'm about like, you know, back in this range, you think? Is it going to get some signal? I thought I would talk to you about keys first. Like what it means to be in a key. Because people come to me for instruction sometimes and they say, yeah, I'm working on the, my modes. It's interesting that they use the word my modes, you know, and, uh, and we talk about it, you know. Um, They'll say, oh yeah, I'm working on Dorian or something. And I say, what is that? And it's like the two chord of a, of a major scale. And I say, oh, okay, uh, why are you working on that? And they say, well, they, they think they're supposed to. And I say, well, that's fine. It's, why is it a mode? And uh, then we go round and round for a while usually and find out it's just, just a sound, just, you know, like every every kind of key that you can play in is just an equal partner in the harmonic rainbow. And I was like, this is Dorian to me. This is one shade of Dorian. Why is that Dorian? Does anybody want to tell me why that sounds like Dorian? Like if you were in the car and you heard it, how would you know it's Dorian? How do we know we're in a Dorian key instead of a Fractolian key or something, you know? How about we'd hear the bright sound of the chord other than the tonic chord? Like, we got a tonic chord here, a minor chord, right? A minor. But instead of being dark, the next chord, like, that's kind of a beautiful dark chord. This is a less dark. The reason is that it's using the note that makes Dorian sound a little different than a few other scales, like this note. Yeah, that's right, the raised six or the major six or the large six instead of the, instead of, so it's a D major chord instead of a D minor. Well, I don't know, I think all this stuff's important. Not to be intellectual about it, that 
that doesn't count for beans with me because I just want to play guitar. But uh, you, when you end up teaching for a living, as I do, then you have to try to explain things, and it's good to know why things sound differently. So that's probably why a lot of you are here too, is to understand music better. At least part of the reason you're here. I don't mean tonight in this clinic, but I mean at the school. So if we do this. What kind of a、uh, key are we in now? How about Aeolian? Because we have that. Instead of、uh, that stuff is really good for shading differences.、Uh, So when you're in A minor, we're just using A minor as a reference key. Anytime you hear the F major seven, it doesn't sound depressing because it's a kind of a brighter chord, of course, major chord. But this note, if you put it in a D minor chord, a D minor chord. No, I don't get depressed over music anyway. I hope you people don't.、Uh, I don't care how sad the notes are. I'm not depressed. I might be、uh, wanting to leave certain buildings at certain times. It, it won't be because of depression.、Usually. This doesn't sound depressing to me. I understand that, like in films, they'll use sounds like these for sad, sad moments. But it doesn't make me feel sad. It just makes me feel strong feelings. I don't know what they are. <laughs> I shouldn't make light of it, but it... this is supposed to be a sad note, a real sad note. We're not talking in Branford Marsalis, as in boy, that's sad, man. I don't mean it that way. Just now, is minor supposed to be sad too? It's starting to sound sad compared to what I was playing before. You got that same F note in the key of A minor, but now it's part of D minor six. D minor six nine. Chord of mystery. To me, like, to me maybe I've seen too many videos, TV.、It、doesn't make me feel sad, you know. Major's happy and minor's sad. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't feel like it. There's that F sharp. He's sneaking back in. How come? Why? Because it's fun to play him. But you're leaving the key. No, we're just leaving the diatonic framework. We all know that we're in the key of A minor if we hear lines. All part of A minor is no problem. Just, it's just all different notes in the key center, so it's not diatonic anymore in the strict sense of one scale generating the harmony. But、uh, that doesn't really matter, you know. I mean, just another option. It matters. I shouldn't put it that way. I'd say it's a, it's just fine. How's that? I mean, it, both things are good. And,、uh, If we're in A minor and we hear, kind of on the dark side, not meaning bad again, just darker compared to. There's that note again. It really jumps out. How much difference? Happens when you play. Now let's talk about、uh, what we used to call Oliver Nelson voicings years ago, because he was one of the first cats to kind of put them in records and stuff. He would voice horns like in four parts, real close together, but he would use hip chords. He wouldn't just play uh, straight uh, colors like dominant sevens and stuff too much.、Uh, 
Boy, you can speak a lot of stuff about close harmony chords, but just for the moment, for an A minor, if you vamp to a chord like this, our ears say that we're in the key still. We're, we're just on like a, a five chord. I think many of you know that just by hearing it. Now, the one note that we'd be real surprised to be playing in A minor at that moment, I would think would be what? If we're really in A minor. Anybody? C sharp, right, but here that baby is. She's hiding here because she likes to get in from out of the cold and join the party. She's there. So the what I'm speaking about here is buried buried dissonance or buried surprise notes. I mean, don't think any notes are bad or out of the key. Maybe you don't anyway, since I don't know all of you, but since I've been doing this teaching gig since 64, you meet a lot of people and you see that a lot of people are uh, full of knowledge, uh, rules they've learned and pre precepts, concepts, and it's all, it's usually all good stuff. It's just, uh, it can inhibit you sometimes from seeing the picture that everything's in the key. Everything's in every key. Does that mean A minor? I don't know. We don't hear a center. Key means the center. If you do this, this is a lot of fun. I like doing this. But obviously we're not in the key of A minor anymore. I don't think we're in B flat minor either. It's no key, obviously, but that doesn't mean it's bad. It's just an effect. It's There's that chord with the C sharp in it. Now, if we put that baby on top of it, if we go... For some years, that's not going to sound as congruent in A minor if, you, if you're expecting here. on how you hear I've gotten used to it but if this note troubles you or if any note that what I'm trying to convey here and not doing the most concise job of is if any note troubles you in, a, in any, any kind of key um, bury it inside the chord you know I take this thing put it somewhere where it's not in the soprano because we tend to hear soprano the most <clears throat> I don't know if anybody's noticed the trend in the last till. Oh, I don't know, let's say 15 years to add 11 chords. Add 11 chords. They're like all over the place now, you know. Candy bar commercials, unmentionables, just everywhere, you know. I mean, used to be you couldn't play those notes together, you know. Certainly producers didn't like it. We all like it now, I think. People like it now. I don't know if a lot of you know that in the old days, when this is how music sounded somewhat, they didn't even have yellow, I don't think, man. I mean, at one time, you know? I get there'd have to be truth to that, because in the caves, how would they, you know? But, I mean, way after caves, but way before Albert King, somewhere in the middle there was... You know, stuff like that. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they fought over the rest of the notes. <laughs> they did. No, they really did. Try not to spit on the mic, man. <laughs> um, they really didn't know what else to, to add without having full-scale conflagrations break out, you know? I mean, people wearing silk were upset with people who weren't for playing things like, you know, it was called li a licentious note, the third. People were actually killed. And if they'd had firearms, they would have been shot over it. It really was one of those, babe, you know, bad times in history where we proved that we have a lot of growing to do, you know? People, that is. So... Um, if we could 
fight over the inclusion of a note like this, I mean, mankind as a whole, then it's no shock that we're still going to have trouble with some other notes. Like right now, we're not all including these notes as our normal thing, I would say. Just to use one example, it's just the Texas tornadoes, Guns N' Roses. No, it's just not happening yet. And it's probably never going to because that's the only interval not in the overtone series, as a man named Spud Murphy wisely noted once. And uh, it's a the octave plus a half step. That's the most troublesome interval to work with harmony-wise. Obviously, I'm free associating up here. I, I don't know how else to live, so you'll hopefully put up with it for a while longer. <laughs> I, I promise to play a few notes together, too. Uh, but uh, anyway, yeah, this, this interval's a problem, and you maybe have noticed it. If you just played that too much, you know, you can clear out a building real fast. <laughs> Or, or get the club owner to pay you, actually, you know. <laughs> I don't think so. No. <laughs> it's a funny interval. It needs help. Uh, <laughs> this isn't supposed to be funny. I don't know why it's coming out that way, but it's fine. I'm having a good time, too. Um, this doesn't sound right to most of us. We need it we need to make it sound like functional harmony. If you play um you establish a key Okay, so we're in say B. Old style harmony. Old style mean like a few decades, 50s, 60s voicings. So people don't even play that kind of stuff too much, as, or as much, shall we say, as lingering chords, chords you just want to linger on. Yet it's not offensive anymore. It's not like strange, and because it's got other notes to soften it. But if you hit any intervals when you're doing uh, your harmonizing songs and things that really sound bad, uh, the likelihood is that there are other notes that can be added to make it better if you're not aware of that. Don't give up on it. What I mean by that, too, is there's a strategy where you, you, know, you harmonize a song by just say, adding a bass line first to the melody. Um, gosh, what's a melody we could do it with? Uh, this is an old tune. You better not put it in that key for you people. Huh? How about uh, F? Um, you, you take that and maybe just add a bass that goes... We're just walking down the key by doing that. That's no problem to understand, I, I hope. When I say the key, I mean a, ma a diatonic major key, of course, if you don't know there. Um, by the way, on our breaks, if anybody's troubled by things I'm saying and needs to ask me questions, please do. Or if you can't stand it, you know, like during is fine, too. You can shoot your hands up and we'll converse. I don't have to just give a, a speech up here. We can interact, you know. That'd be fine with me. I like it, actually. You may have to scream and get my attention, but that's okay, too. So, yeah, we can add a bass part, but anyway, if you should hit funny intervals along the way, like, uh, there's one. I hope somebody knows somebody's getting married pretty soon if they want to. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's that interval. It doesn't sound too weird because we hear the continuity of a key. So most people aren't going to bolt on that. But if you play it slow and listen to it, it's pretty tense. So major seven with seven in the bass. That sounds pretty acceptable in a case like that. When you hear all those lines, people play. Now the interval's buried inside. It's not in soprano anymore. We just 
we're doing now. There was a tune in the 60s based on a Bach thing. It went... Something like that. Major seven, seven in the bass. Bass is definitely generating the harmony. That's not the right chord. this Bach type harmony it's all in a major scale I mean most of it anyway if you want to get more into that kind of harmony you, you play around with uh, two voices at first maybe uh, maybe on the top two strings is a great place to start sometimes say we're in the key of A here I'm just thinking of chords, implied chords. That's what Bach, Bach teaches us that. His music is about chord tones that are stitched together with either scale tones or chromatics. And um, the genius is that there are motifs binding it all together, themes in most cases. And that's a staggering thing that he's got themes as well. But if, if somebody... Uh, wrote in a similar style but didn't use actual themes, they could still get the effect of the harmonic environment of a Bach if they knew his harmonic vocabulary, if they just concentrated on, on uh, chord tones and uh, stitched them together in certain easy kind of ways, frankly. Um, but to write that genius counterpoint and have themes too at the same time, that's another staggering thing. But when you hear themes like, uh, not themes, pardon me, but chord tones like These are all chords. This gets into a kind of a neo baroque thing where. Sometimes I don't try to be uh, totally authentic when I'm playing this music because A, I'm not capable of it. I just can't do it very well. Because I'm moving parallel fifths and stuff, you're not supposed to do that. And uh, B, I just want to create that environment of that kind of harmony sometimes. Um, a guy like Bach is a, a good place to start if you're looking to study a real deep level of diatonic harmony. Just again, the, where we began the discussion about keys generated by uh, scales, the chords of scales. All these notes are right in the scale, but they imply chords. Yet there's little melodies in there. Minor keys, <laughs> we're back to that. I'm just 
trying to improvise some stuff based on the basic chords of the key, which are the one, four, and five. If that's one of Bach's favorite tricks is to use the three main pillars of the key to generate everything. He'll go into that zone for a while, a lot. I promised myself tonight uh, before I showed up that I would talk to you about this harmony of Bach, so we're in it now. But, uh, um, we may have to have a lot of feedback from you folks, too, so I know what people don't understand that I'm saying, because I sure don't want to confuse you. Let's take a key that's easy to think in. Uh, let's take, oh, I don't know, let's, let's go to D minor. So if you're going to try to study the harmony of a giant cat like Bach, and um, by the way, the, the root movements of Bach when he's doing other devices like cycle four, those are just like those old standard tunes, you know? Um, I should face this way a little bit too. Um, those, those things are, you know, like you take a tune like Autumn Leaves. Uh, kind of progressions these things have been around for a long time it's still the same stuff it's like uh Seven leading into G minor. Hmm. So anyway, uh, if you want to, if you want to establish the the harmony of a key like a giant of the nature of box kind of stature, you you got to understand his conceptual thinking and uh, his favorite way to outline a key is to give you massive doses of of uh, the basic chords. But he's got so many voicings and so many ways of just implying the chords by playing two notes or three notes that you have tons of variety that lasted a lifetime for him. I don't think I can, but I'm sure going to give it a go, man. Since you asked. fresh sounding key here that's a, a personal problem of mine I can't stay in one key for a long time sometimes it doesn't sound good to me it starts to lose its charm it's a hope it's not a sad commentary on the other areas of my life actually we know the truth I've lived in this body for 46 years I know if that's true or not it, it's yes and no <laughs> it's just a problem we deal with it it's not uncommon. <laughs> That's, uh...
Sometimes I get personal with these situations because I, I, I want you to know that you're not the only one feeling some of this. Like, I have a real problem with my fingers running the show a lot, and I, I think it's normal kind of guitar. Right? Um, you know, where you, you're actually trying to do something and you can't stop your fingers if you want to continue to be musical at that moment. You know, like you'll be trying to get somewhere into a certain key or something, and yet you don't want to stop playing, so you keep going, and pretty soon you're into something else, and you know that you still haven't lost sight of where you originally wanted to go, but damn if you're not going to get there, though, you know? I mean, you just, not in a few minutes anyway. I mean, I just couldn't get B minor to come out there at the end. It's possession, the man is possessed. <laughs> no, I don't think it's that. It's just, it's kinesthetic, you know? You practice and you watch the news, or you, you're on the phone and. Aeolian? Dorian? Fractolian? You know, and you're just practicing these things, and your fingers get so used to running, they have their own mind. You know how that is. And, uh, it's not good, but it, it saves my butt in a lot of cases. <laughs> it's better than stopping. That's my problem there. Mm. Let's talk about something else, <laughs> like contrary motion, or uh, yeah, let's talk about that. Um, actually, let's let's wait. Let's, I wanted to really talk to you about keys. I started it tonight and got off on this other stuff. So I kind of line up this harmonic rainbow in my mind. And it's got different layers. One layer is an era thing, E-R-A, you know, like when stuff happened. You know, like uh, surprisingly to some, uh, maybe maybe a lot of you notice this, the old sounds, I mean old, like really old stuff. Or at least the Hollywood version of it. That stuff is like, you know, still, you know, Mega, mega rock, man. I mean, it's the power chords. So those, those perfect intervals that were so much running the show in the old days for centuries, they're coming back, you know. I mean, in the last 20 years, they've just charged forward, you know, the so-called power chord. A lot of people have trouble with labels. Look, Frank, he's playing jazz. Mm -hmm. Look, Frank, he's not playing jazz. Mm -hmm. Who knows? I don't know. How about he's tuning? That's all. He's just tuning. It's good chord to tune to. We didn't start to play music yet because we don't have any rhythm or any melody, but we have a, just some color. If we go... starts to be music because we got motion and a little bit of uh, you know nice stuff going on um, chords like this set a mood so that your ear gets hungry for harmony hungrier than just okay let's play in G minor notice how we're not excited by this at all man. I'm not um, 
There's just no no preparation. It's like other areas of life. You got to prepare this stuff. Uh, if you really want to feel it and not have to take a long time. It's different when there's a drummer and a bass player and you're playing with other folks. I play quite a bit with just singers or by myself or things like that. So um, you got to work it a different way. If you're with a drummer or bass player, they get, you know, in a few seconds, if they're together, man, you, you're excited, I hope. So, But, you know, one one instrument, six strings, it could be... You know, a long evening if you got a gig and you got to entertain other folks and yourself. And are we in a key? Well, so far we we assume that we are. We hear something. It's the key. It's the key of Keith Richards. No. <laughs> it kind of has that vibe, huh? I've heard somewhere it sounds like uh, the beginning of Jumpin' Jack Flash or some tune like that. So, um, tuning chords, yeah, chords that have all perfect intervals are great to tune to. They also just establish a key. They don't establish what kind of key you're in, though, other than that you're not in a key that is going to have a flat five instead of a real five or something like that. But um, it's an open book from here. So let's talk about this harmonic rainbow. We've already spoken a little bit about these diatonic major things. I started to talk to you about at 11s just because it's a contemporary sound. Everybody in the room probably knows what a major seven chord is, or, or most everyone. Um, are they a dead issue? No, no way. But they're not, you know, the cutting edge of what's happening and a lot of people's choice of what they want to hear, that's all. I never get tired of them, but you either love them or you don't. Are we modulating? Depends on your point of view. I'm still hearing this is the key. But now we're in a Mediterranean influenced or Arabic or Hebraic or Spanish flamenco influenced. Still the same key. What happened to Ma? He's gone because he didn't sound right right now. It's tough to bring back a major seven once you've established a flat seven. It can be really tough. Uh, easy way that people who play uh, Spanish influenced tonalities do it is I don't know if they're conscious of it or not, but you play a seven flat five chord up a half step or a fifth higher, either way. And it's got that note in there either hiding in there or if it's not hiding so that note's back instead of I guess we should talk about gypsy scales for just a moment they're not codified yet in all the books you know I, it's okay we're growing let's say key of A you've got A you want a standard gypsy scale in case you don't know this? Because I promised myself whether I thought you already got this at school or not, I'd have to assume that maybe you didn't get this particular slant on it, so I would try it with you. Um, if you're wondering why I'm spending so much time talking, I just have to feel like um, I need to I need to do these things. That's all I can tell you. I, have, I won't sleep right if I don't talk about some of these things. That scale just has a lowered second and a lowered sixth to begin with, which is why it sounds non-American, non-Anglo-Saxon. A scale like that, or a harmony like that, is decidedly American. Suddenly you go. You 
you notice that note, I hope you notice it, it's because it's what changes these American scales into something else. It's not the only note, it's this other note. But this note by itself won't do it because uh, say you're an A, you play an F chord. Those aren't modulations, those are just the expanded diatonic root tones. Fancy words just means the 12 tone tonal key, the American kind of 12 tone key that's music that's natural to our ear. And the F note's part of the key of A in the large sense. It's just not diatonic to the major scale, that's all. But in a major key, we're definitely going to use F every now and then or a lot, depending on what kind of harmony you play. If you stick to the old style jazz, you probably only use an F chord as a, a tritone sub, you know, all that stuff. But, you know, if you're influenced by other things, the F sounds like just a normal, normal part of the key, but in a non diatonic way. So when you play A to F, it doesn't sound like gypsy scales, gypsy tonality, nothing. I mean, none of that stuff. But if you play the B flat, you're starting to get there now. With that major third, and this note is a complement to it. Then you either have a dominant seven or lowered seven, let's call it, or a major seven. So, uh, gypsy dominant, gypsy major, or reverse the words, dominant gypsy or dominant major. I say gypsy because uh, I don't know why. I just say it. It just sounds. It sounds to me like that kind of culture had a lot of discussion with these tones. Could call them Arabic scales, <clears throat> like I was saying, Spanish scales, whatever you like. Uh, when you play that scale and um, or those sounds, and well, let's take a, a left turn for just a second. We're coming right back. I'm not going to go off. Those notes. Anybody, uh, a single word, an adjective, what those notes sound like? Blues. Thank you very much. Um, they're a blue thing, you know. They're blue sounding. When you hear, especially this this inflection between the blue third, which is higher than the minor third, it's a little bit higher, the major third. Blue third is just like the sharp nine, too, real similar, I mean, either way. But anyway, that's a cool little scale. That's a scale that just has a root and a sharp nine and a third and a fifth and a flat seven. So it's like a blues scale where you kick the fourth down to the third and you're then thereby using all the notes of a raised nine chord. An altered dominant chord that we use as a tonic chord, by the way, I'm sure all of you are aware of that, but it's, it is kind of disturbing to rule makers. Ooh. Altered chords are built from the five, you know. Hey, they ain't always built from the five, man. It's just the one chord. Right now, anyway. So you take that scale, those five notes, and uh, just add in those two gypsy notes, half step. I didn't make clear before. They're a half step above the root in the fifth. So if we add these two notes into that scale. Now, now we have Kind of gives you some of that kind of harmony, that that kind of flamenco, semi-flamenco uh, to the purists. I don't blame you. I'm kind of butchering this stuff, but you get the general flavor of it. Uh, then there's a six-note version of that scale, and both of those scales, of uh, the six-note scale, just leaves out the fifth. And both of these latter two scales, by the way, I call that one the gypsy blue scale because it's so blue. But 
then we have those other two notes we're adding, yes. Uh, be glad to. Uh, what we have to do is is clear, uh, clarify one one more little point. Um, if you leave that fifth out, then this thing we're all going to take a break real soon too. In a few minutes, I won't uh, forget that we need to have an intermission here. Um, right now, it's wearing that other hat. It doesn't sound like a jazz scale, for instance. At least not to my ears, because of the kind of chords we're hearing. But if somebody's playing, right there, when you hear, it's almost like the alter dominant scale, but it doesn't have that flat five. Now that's the six note version of it, where you just leave the fifth out. I hear Wes Montgomery and uh, that was chromatic. This, um, so in a blues, it just depends. You'd sneak it right in on that chord. Anytime you have an altered dominant, you can play that six-note gypsy jazz altered dominant. These words are terrible. It's that thing, you know. That's a, I sometimes just say gypsy jazz. I just like to be able to say a couple words to describe a scale. We just don't have names yet for some of these scales. That's just, you know, harmonic minor. We all know what that means. Which I can't seem to find a use for in jazz if I'm playing over each chord and want it to sound ultra hip. I know all the books say you learn your harmonic minor. I love them, but they don't sound like jazz it's because of this. It doesn't sound as hip as, like, you know, Coltrane or Miles or Them Cats. It just sounds like a, a guy in Encino playing a harmonic minor. <laughs> Anyway, we're going to take a little break because I'm perspiring like mad and this microphone's a little bit intimidating, but we're working with it, trying to work with it, and uh, we'll come back soon and talk about more things and play, and uh, maybe we'll have quest more questions from you. I love having the questions because I don't know what to talk about up here. There's a lot of stuff that's fascinating to me, but it may not interest you, but if people ask, then at least I'm, I'm connecting with one person, so we'll be back soon.
Thank you very much. Been moving a lot of furniture recently. My hand kind of gave out on me in the end there, but uh, started out with a bang. It's funny how much of uh, playing is contingent about what just looks like hand. You know, you go in the market and you grab some carrots. And you're using your hands. If if you're like most of us, we take these things for granted. But you know, why is it work one day and Moving furniture won't work so well. Playing guitar for 18 hours. Next day, watch out. Play. <laughs> These guitars are uh, set up so that uh, I can run some heavier strings. Helps the tone a little bit, helps the, the ring. You don't need heavy strings, as you probably know, to get a good ring. Actually, I've got it backwards. Uh, I like to tune down, and in tuning down, you, you generally have to use a thicker string somewhat. And uh, the bonus is you get a nice ring at the same time. I like to tune down because you get a little more bass. Now, right there, when I went down to the D, it, it was actually less bass. That means we're not picking up the fundamental, as they say in the books. It's actually a little stronger right there. There is a place where, you know, whoa, fundamental came back on that note. I don't know why. Of course, the speaker doesn't like it. Wow, a C note. Yeah, too bad that isn't like a Marshall cabinet. play a little blues uh, I always seem when I can't feel right now I don't feel for sure what I feel like uh, rhythmically sometimes you can gauge how what tunes to play by what kind of rhythm you'd really like to feel but when I can't ascertain that my way of dealing with it on a job or in a situation like this notice we separate the two <laughs> is to uh, you just kind of play a blues or a tune that's got that feeling because I should speak for myself, it always seems to be welcome. I just like the colors of the blues a lot. So we'll play something that's got a bluesy feel to it.
Something I try to do when, to jumpstart myself a little more when I'm feeling the need for that is uh, I just keep changing the tuning. <laughs> so we're going to go down another half step. I, I think I'll be happier. tough those plain third strings get real wobbly don't they when you tune down if anybody's tried it but I can't abide a, a, a wound third because I can't get the volume and bending is is over <laughs> you just can't bend them right of course I've been doing a lot of bending tonight <laughs> no I do like all that stuff I'm just uh sitting up here by myself doing something else so. I don't know what I'm going to play we're just going to fool around go into something
Thanks, Mick. Thanks so much. Uh, maybe I'll take a, a few questions if there are any. Uh, somebody wants to talk to me about anything. These days or when I was a kid? No? Either one. Um, huh. Wow, there's been so many. Uh, working backwards, like I was telling somebody, I really love Danny Gatton right now. I just don't spend a lot of time listening to guitar players. Eric Johnson sounds fantastic. I mean, uh, Alan Holdsworth, all these guys. I mean, there's so many great. But I don't, I don't listen to guitar players a lot because uh, I'm a pretty busy guy. Uh, seems like I listen to uh, the orchestra more. I dig the orchestra. And I, I like arrangers and composers who write for the orchestra. So it uh, seems like because I like old movies a lot, I'll, I'll check out. I get the both things done at once. You know, you're watching a great film and you can't believe how great the music is sometimes. So. But wow, man, if you want to talk great musicians that uh, one can listen to, you know, the list is long, right? <laughs> If I asked you, you'd probably say this. you'd have a long list of guys. A lot of human beings that have played some great music. I like a lot of styles. I mean, I, I taped Aretha Franklin on a morning talk show this morning because she was live in Detroit. At least it was a rerun, but it was live when they did it. And she came bouncing up on the stage, and I just made sure my VCR was on. I'll go back, and I'm sure she's going to sing a note or two, and so I'll be on the floor, you know. I like singers a lot. I work with a singer and uh, trying to get a little of, you know, the vocal-like expressiveness that they get. So, answer your question. Yes. Kind of uh, not as much as I used. I always used to be, I don't know, man, I was driven this way when I was younger and I, I seemed to go in a different direction just right now. but. I like playing bass for some reason now. I don't know what happened. I don't do it well, but I, I mean, I, activity shouldn't be confused with achievement, right? <laughs> so, so when we, uh, I mean, I like the feeling of hearing these cats playing, not swing, but bop, you know. I like that. I really dig that feeling. So I'll look over at my singer friend, you know, she's, open to any kind of music and she likes jazz a lot and, and I'll just start doing that on some tune but I can't do that and play the chords in a great melody and call long distance at the same time you know <laughs> in fact just the bass is about all I can get at that tempo uh, I used to play a lot of medium things I'm just kind of a medium cat My, I run on frenzy inside but it doesn't manifest it's trapped you know <laughs> It's never come out, except that time in jail, and we don't want to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I just kind of medium. Latter-day Jim Hall, in that sense. Follow his. Yeah, that's true. The real story, I'm not trying to be funny, is I asked my teacher, he came to the pad, he had two guitars, a blonde one and a pink and black one. It was 1950. Uh, blah, 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 seven, fall of 57, and Elvis Presley had been around for a year and a half, and I had uh, overcome initial resistance. Why is everyone screaming? I don't get it, to saying, hey, it sounds great. And his guitar player, you know. I mean, he was doing that stuff, man. When you're a kid and you hear that, you, you love it. <laughs> I did. And, uh, Elvis's favorite colors were pink and black, and I asked the teacher, how does he play? And he said, right-handed, because he asked me, how are you going to play, you know? So I'll, if Elvis played right-handed, I, I always thought he was doing those parts. When you're a kid, you don't find out till later it's a guy named Scotty Moore, and, you know, everyone on the stage is right-handed. <laughs> so that's why I play. But it's probably an advantage because I like harmony the most on guitar. I like rhythm and I like melody, both a whole chunk, but I like chords in my greatest area of fascination. All, it seems to have been for many years, so... Probably it probably helps me more than it hurts me. Sure. That's the story of my life. Am I say the question? I'm sorry, I cut you off. I'm so. Am I doing them what? No, I'm not. I I I do others too. Yeah. 
Yeah, we try. Yeah, when, I'm I'm not being humble. I'm saying try because some, it gets harder to be accurate up there. The only guy I've ever seen who's consistently accurate and you know, scary is Tal Farlow. No matter what else is happening for the guy, even if he doesn't feel he's having a great day and that both hands aren't as strongly happening, man, he'll go into that. He'll just be playing and he'll... Has anybody ever seen him doing that? He'll just jump up another octave and he's up in here where the dust marks are, you know, and it's like, how does he get that thing to be accurate? It's amazing. I'm mainly going up an extra fifth most of the time to get those extra notes. If you go up a different interval than that, well, there's... A fourth interval up will give you two octaves, and a fifth up will give you the fifth in two spots, mind you. On consonant chords, you get more consonant intervals. Example, this is a consonant chord. There are no notes to trouble anybody from Kansas to the ends of the globe, you know? It's just easy on the ear. So you put that baby up a fifth. <laughs> Ooh wee. <laughs> Love that chord. Wow. Some extra extra goodies up there. The seventeenth, the infamous. Tried and found innocent. <laughs> By chord of Court of no appeal. 17th, yeah, it's a special note. We don't usually talk about 13 because life's too hard already, you know. But there's one note up there that's a special one that you don't, you can't identify it accurately and express that it is a separate effect on the nervous system unless you give it a separate number. If you want to be precise, and you can just say, oh, it's a third up couple octaves, but it really feels different up there. It only works that way above an 11th. If you just play a third up high, even in a beautiful dominant chord or something, it sounds great, but it doesn't have that magic effect, you know, where you just, something magical happens in suspended dominant chords or 11th chord type things where you have other overtones way up high. Um, when you take uh, non-consonant chords, by the old standards of dissonance, you know? Like to them, this was a dissonance, you know? Dissonance. <laughs> so you play a chord even with a flat seven up a fifth. Well, let's make it, let's not stack the deck. Here's uh, B9. Here it is up a fifth. Call Leonard Nimoy soon, <laughs> you know? I mean, there's... But I'm not sure that's happening the way an altered chord up a fifth would be like this, I love. That is just so out. I mean, if you're going to go out, go out, you know, way out. That's what I call my Columbo chord because I, I love that TV show. And that, there's usually a part where Columbo is on to the cat. Well, Columbo is always on to the cats, we find out from the beginning. Or ladies, there are a lot of lady villains. Uh, the villain is often a lady in... Wonderful actresses in that show, but that's another story. Anyway, whoever the murderer is, gender not standing, some, at some point they figure out that, uh, that Columbo's on to them. We know that Columbo's been on to them because otherwise it wouldn't be on TV. That we can sense something's going on. <laughs> but there's this moment where it happens, and like he'll leave the room. He's already come back, oh, just one more thing, three times, you know? <laughs> and it's like... I just looks out in the space like, oh, no, man, I thought I got away with it, you know? <laughs> kind of a riot. Yeah, that, that's the closest we can get, I can get right now to some of those chords. Now, if you play a third or fifth up from a chord, any chord, you get that same kind of wildness, that same kind of <clears throat> crazy kind of notes. Um, That's a third higher. That's an E. While I'm playing C, I'm thinking E. Or a sixth. Same thing. When I say third, I don't mean three frets, you know. I just think of the alphabet. Uh, 
For me, music theory is an easy thing. When I was a kid, it was a hard thing. Um, I used to give up on it all the time and just go back to it. I was happy doing that for a long time. I still am, but theory is an easy thing because it's just about an alphabet. Man, it's just an alphabet, people. Just A through what? G, I guess. There's no H. It just stops. That's right. That's right. There's the H, right? That's B and what? And then B flat is, is B, huh? That's a wild country, man. <laughs> That's a wild country. Um, we know it's wild if they start with that premise in the alphabet to begin with. So anyway, yeah, our alphabet's a little... Um, it's easy. To, a, a through G. You know, you put some sharps and flats in when you learn about all the precision aspects of theory, you know, which scales have what and so on. But... God darn it, it's just an alphabet, you know. Um, I've been lucky to make a living as a guitar teacher, and people uh, sometimes leave after spending an hour, and the assignment is for them to work hard on a few different things, one of which is to learn the notes and the scales. And I invariably, if, I, if the brain's working well, tell them to do it descending first, because m much, much more music goes down than up in terms of the flight of the roots, the names of the alphabetical, you know, like all that. There aren't as many ascending progressions that have made their way into the fabric. Even the way we voice lead progressions of force or what they used to call the cycle of fifths, what I've been calling cycle force for a long time, because I like to think forwards, like A minor 7, D7, the G, and all that stuff. Um, and the traditional resolutions are tones falling. You, you probably saw, you know, when I'm playing, if I'm doing that kind of stuff, I mean, the hands go down more than up. Um, doesn't mean that music doesn't go up a lot. It's just that the names and or the voice leadings go down. So we have to be able to think descending more than ascending. It's a wild thing. They don't, you know, you don't go to school and they go, okay, Z... What the hell is it? X, Y, Z, Y, X, W, V. You don't learn it backwards. You just A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So it's a kind of an important thing to be able to think that other way. What was the question? <laughs> Any other questions? Somebody like this? Yeah. Yeah, the thumb, you use the thumbnail and the first finger. You know, instead of using two hands, say on the on the twelfth fret where you have your open harmonic, um, you know how to do you, do you know how to do it that way, or did you learn a classical way with the one and the four? With the first finger, with the first finger, this kind of thing, one and three. It's a good way, especially if you play with nails, you'll probably get a nice balance and everything. The thing is that if you want to do this harp stuff, you have to have the thumb running on its own track. It helps to have it be with the first finger, and then these three are ready to do other things. For instance, if you like to play closer to a McCoy Tyner kind of a thing or a, a Winton Kelly thing, you know... Um, those kind of voicings. I'm using one chime and three regular notes. But if I've already got one and three occupied on getting the lowest note as a chime, it's tough to tell the thumb to get into the middle of the pack now. It'd make an, a, an interesting photo for a guitar book cover. <laughs> so. Here the ch 
chime. I'm not doing a great job on it right now. It changes those chords too. It's a close harmony. Sure, sure. That's that's what I'm trying to do now, actually, but I'm just not getting it real clear. I'm going to go on the top strings where it might sound better. Maybe I'll, I'll lessen the reverb. You might be able to hear it a little better. Hmm. Okay, here... Uh, So here's some chords. Middle four strings. Real balanced. I tell you, if it's a good set of strings and the body vibrates real lot, you get an organ like. You can set it for steel guitar, you know, you intend it to sound like a steel guitar, Leo, but anyway, same thing now with the chime in there. It's audible. I'm getting a little plunk out of it because I'm hitting it too hard and the string's a little low for this gauge. My only regret with Italy is it doesn't have a middle pickup. I don't need a bar. I like a bar a lot, a whammy bar, but I just move the neck a lot, so that's almost the same. But um, <clears throat> This sound, the in-between sound is good though, you know, the mixed pickup for, for chimes, because it blends the chime note with the others. to get close harmony. But with this stuff, you it's just about the same versus where it's so muddy. Your best bet with chimes is uh, for production guitar, probably Strat. You know, Strat type guitars because of that middle pickup. So let's take another question. Sure. You you come and play it because I've never worked it out enough, man. I love the tune though. You want to play? I don't mean to be rude. I'm sorry. Uh, I wish I could. I will play something else if you like. Yeah, we'll, we'll do some of that if you like. Not to my satisfaction. <laughs> Someday I'd like to. I can play it, but you know, it's like... No, I mean, you know, sometimes you play it, but you can't find other things to do that you would like to do, you know? That's the problem. I, I, I confess, I'm a hard-to-please guy, man. I really am. I'm not in certain areas of life at all. I'm fairly amiable, but God, man, with music, I am just terrible. I don't know why. Um, it gets worse through the years, too. I just, But I'm about staying even because I'm learning better ways to deal with it. You know, like switch guitars if I'm bored. It's hard to find things that, you know, are really exciting sometimes, you know? 
having said that, I'm grateful to just be able to play. You know, I mean, I don't want to seem like I'm really upset about it because that's taking it too far. I may wince and everything, but underneath it, I'm just, I mean, if somebody said, you happy to be here, I'd say, sure, man, of course. Get to play. Stand up for tellies. I love tellies. <laughs> Song lists are good things. Don't want to have to rely on them, but I haven't been playing enough gigs, so I wrote down some tunes from my last gig. Okay, we're going to try a tune called... Um, I would do a little of a medley of Like Someone in Love and Someone to Watch Over Me. I like these songs. How about Tenderly? Was sneak down in? No, I don't know. It's a good song.
never made it to those other songs. I forgot about them. <laughs> Crazy. Definitely want to play something like this now. I can feel it.
Bill, we take a few more questions, then. Um, yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. We didn't do. <laughs> Let me take a sip of water for a moment. I love this subject. <laughs> it doesn't mean I know a lot. You can love pastry and not know how to cook it. You know. Most of us do. Yeah, what you mean, man? I know how to cook it. <laughs> These people here have been very, very kind. They're providing me with water, things to wipe out the water. <laughs> I'm serious. They're most gracious. Uh, country motion. What would you like to know? <laughs> um, when... Contrary motions when notes go in opposite directions, either away from each other or towards each other. It's a, it's a bipolar planet we live on, you know, all those opposites. So the most traditional forms that are still used to, to make money with, we'll put it in crass terms, I don't mind. It's good stuff. Um, are diatonic contrary motion intervals because they sound good. Um, they just sound great. So, you might just do three in a row, you know, where the notes, one note's going up a scale and one's going down. You know what I'm saying? Two string instrument. Doesn't sound as rich. Because part of the trick of harmony is to, if one wants to, is to let notes ring. I'm a real fan of that. I want notes to ring. Um, I'm still holding this note that came one note before. I did a leap there. I didn't go in the... That would have been the next stock diatonic contrary. Interval. You can just do a few in a row and then break out. Bass line's going down while the melody goes up. They can be stepwise, they could be both leaping. It sounds like it's going to be too stock, but if you choose some good chords, it's not right. Okay. Gotta, I mean, that's the beauty of both counterpoint and, in this case, contrary motion. You can find new chord progressions that you wouldn't have thought of. And, um, it's a good thing, you know? So anyway, yeah, oppose, if somebody says, well, how do we study this stuff? You're so glib about it. Whoops. Contrary motion. Two-string universe, you know, just goodbye. You know, they both just kind of <laughs> coming back again. <laughs> so that's the other, you know. So you can do a diatonic, and then there's chromatic, chromatic counterpoint or chromatic contrary motions to be specific. Is uh, there are two main kinds, uh, maybe three, let's say two for starters. One is that which is tonally bound, and I'll explain what I mean in a second, and that which isn't, that which doesn't sound like you're in keys or anything. So first the tonally bound one. 
no one who's lived in this country and listened to pop music since the Beatles hasn't heard progressions like this in the bass. back to Bach or uh, if you want to get certain kinds of flavors you start actually a, a century after Bach at the Romantics uh, I'm not sure that's the right name but all the books call it the Romantic period you know it sounds often like uh, I'm, and I'm not being snide I, I think it's dramatic music the Romantic music to me sounds like the Impressionistic music that Debussyan just like wow people in love, you know? This doesn't sound like people in love, they're working at it, you know? <laughs> Romantic? I don't know, I thought that's what that meant. <laughs> anyway, um, these are always implied chords, too, if you study enough harmony. It's not a big mystery that that would be like A. This will probably sound like G concert for anybody tuning their guitar. I'm probably a whole step down. But anyway, one, five. We'll talk function. That might be easier. One. Sounds like a five. This sounds like a dominant seven on the one chord. I mean, like if you're an A, like an A7, which will be the five of the four chord. four minor or a flat six if you're sneaky like John Lennon was in Lucy in the Sky. This is the one if you want it to be. Sharp four half diminished. You go now that ain't that basic. Come on, there's gotta be an easier name. You could say two chord. It's like that song uh, to be speaking about contrary motion, I know. This is, we're just talking about how this bass line on that degree of the key is often a dominant seven on the two if you want it to be. Uh, there, you, you know, there are a lot of little things that you study in harmony that you, you just have to memorize, but they always make sense because harmony makes sense. Um, something that I wanted to say about this chromatic thing. I don't want to lose it. Oh yeah, I spoke about that Lucy in the Sky. That's a great example because people have heard it. You've got this line. It's not completely chromatic. A lot of chromatic harmony occasionally has a whole step. But notice how this will fall down while this melody just kind of goes up at the same time so you get... Actually, that fits the subject more of chromatically generated harmony more than contrary motion, but it's a little bit contrary oriented there. Uh, if you want to study uh, chromatic contrary motion where you're not bound in a key, then there, it can get boring real fast because it, it doesn't ground many people's nervous system in a pleasing way where you feel like you're happy with the results but uh, you can make some rule like here my rule is I'm going to try to stay in only structures that are in one of the two whole tone scales so all those chords are in I like to call the whole tone scales X and Y just for simplicity so what every other one is in X and every other one's in Y but where are you going to use this stuff? You can't make money doing it. Unless you score for films and TV. But it's exciting to know a little of that harmony to me. I want to know all this stuff a little bit. 
never know, man, when you might have to scare a kid for fun. They get to scare you back, though. They definitely get to scare you back. They, you owe them. Here's a fun thing that can matter. Contrary motion. Move the top line and then answer it with the bottom two notes each time. Wild harmony. Uh, I got that from the old Universal films. They used to use that kind of harmony when Frankenstein and the boys would show up. Notice how, again, it's not, it's not evil sounding, really. But it, you know, it's got a sinister edge, a tiny bit, but it's not like just so gone where, you know, it's like, oh man, take it, you know? <laughs> There's at least some kind of strange pleasingness when you have strange chords over strange basses, but they're kind of talking to each other and they're all floating. They're not all just kind of brr, brr, brr. So it's the dialogue texture that helps. They were really clever in finding these things out. They had uh, to be pioneers back then, in the, in the, especially in the 30s and 40s, man. It was all new, film scoring. It's just an incredible art. And uh, you can learn a lot from that. Uh, some other things are just stay in one, stay on a string set for a while and let some intervals appear. Like if you do just a few chromatic intervals, just, let, just try and freeze one note in the middle, see what happens. surprised by the results. Honestly, I am. I didn't know that was going to happen. I sure didn't know that would happen. How did he get in there, you know? You know? I mean, just things happen. Let's freeze a different note. Uh-oh. Definitely got an interesting business. Now, that's one of those chords where you have, like, a natural nine and a raised nine or something weird like that is going on, right? Something that's not as normal. Like if it's an A chord, we have the sharp five and the regular five. If it's this thing, now that doesn't sound right, but that's starting to sound almost like a consonant sound. So you will find some weird things that way. Anyway, let's say we freeze this. We were supposed to be doing an experiment. Wow. That's exciting. Some of that's hiding in there. Wow. I am amazed. That minor. Wow, that minor is exciting. Well, you people didn't come here to see me get excited, so... <laughs> Ah, yes, we did. Uh, this kind of Gorgo the Monster six string chord um, <laughs> contrary motion where you just. Just weird stuff, you know, with a lot of this stuff floating around the bottom, or its best friend, this thing. This is the. that on purpose because I get hungry to hear something sweet and great after uh, all that that kind of noisy stuff but I like the noise too I do
funny, you know, you'd, you would do all this talking about exercise and stuff, but a good tune is much more valuable to learn, you know. Playing songs, man, is the best thing to do on guitar for learning the instrument, I, I feel. Um, not for soloing, not for single string as much, but for everything else, learning how to comp and everything. If you learn enough voicings or your melody and your harmony have to work together, you'll be able to comp in a few months after that, you know, if you just put your mind to it. Um, I found that out because uh, I hadn't done any comping, but I'd worked a lot on solo guitar, and then I, I did a little work with comping, and, and it, was, it was easier. But taste is another story, acquiring taste. Um, I've been fighting a bad toothache for a few days. It's, it's starting to get the upper hand here, so we're probably going to end this real soon here, unless uh, somebody has a more question. Sure. Voicings that I don't find useful? Yeah. Well, sure, you know, uh, but it wouldn't, it'd be more important which ones you you would uh, find attractive or not, but it's all about organization at first. You, you want to, uh, you want to be organized in your approach if time permits, and, um, <laughs> You, uh, you're bound to find things in being organized that are more pleasing to you than others. Um, case in point, if I study the 13th chords on guitar systematically, which I try to do, I try to, I love the feeling of music. Maybe you can tell me, I can't barely sit, I can, to put it in better English, I can barely sit still when I'm playing. I mean, I just like the whole thing. But to study it is, is to me, is also partly, uh, you got to be like a hard line science cat, man, as opposed to a, a musician like, yeah, I'll, I'll be around that, yeah, you know, whatever, man. It's not like, you know. And in doing that, you want to study systems of voicings. That's what I'm getting to. And in studying systems, nature doesn't call the same tune on each one. For example, uh, Dominant 13, no root. We'll do it in, uh, we'll do it in A. Mm. Top four strings, not close harmony, but next largest, next size after that. Like A13, mm. A13. Some people can't, to use the current vernacular, hang with this chord, man. You're smiling, I think you can. I'm smiling, I think I can. We're getting more open-minded genetically or something's going on in the planet. It's, you don't hear that in 50s jazz as much or anything. You know? Definitely not the early New Orleans jazz, that's for sure. They kick you off stage. This is all normal, but then we get to this. This sounds like in this key. It doesn't sound like A13, but it's almost A13. So, do I like, you know, Ted, do you find any chords you don't like? I like it, but I wouldn't bring it home to dinner and call it A13, you know? It's just not that. To the ear, you know? So don't be ashamed not to have preferences. That's just part of life, man. You have favorite guitar players, right? Favorite uh, foods, the whole bit. It's just life. Yeah, I've got some painkillers that I, I knew that they'd wear off in the evening. And, uh, so we'll Good night, Lance. Yes. Good night, last season, Lance. Thanks for showing up, and uh, it's been my pleasure. <laughs>